Leviticus 26 this morning. We've come to the sections that we might call Appendix A and Appendix B. Remember, Leviticus outlines how the people of God could approach the presence of God in this mobile temple called the tabernacle. They needed to come with an understanding of the substitutionary atonement that the Messiah would accomplish. That's what the sacrificial system reminded them of. They couldn't come on their own. They needed a, a holy mediator to represent them before God. And that too pointed them to the Messiah as the priest served as symbols and stand-ins until the Messiah would come. They, need to, they needed to remember that they approached God as a distinct people. They were to be set apart and different from the godless nations surrounding them. They needed to be people who valued life and had reverence for God as the author of life. That's what the ceremonial law taught them. And all of that brought them to the Day of Atonement. These two verses summarize the content of the law codes that Leviticus has already detailed. The imagery and the promise of the Messiah are still present here, but God through Moses summarizes this simple idea. Be devoted to God. Keep the Sabbaths. Don't make idols. Don't bow down to them. Be devoted to God. Keep the Sabbaths. Rest and trust in God's promises. Have reverence for the sanctuary. Have reverence for this place where God would dwell among you, he tells Israel. Have reverence for that space and don't defile it. He's already outlined all the ways that they might defile it bringing the stain and stench of death in on their bodies and in their hearts. And he's already prescribed remedies for them washing that off. So this is a summary command. The themes of relationship, rebellion, and reconciliation are as present at the end of the book as they have been throughout it. But as we launch into chapter 26, or Appendix A, as I'm calling it, we see that God promises them certain results if they choose to obey or disobey the things that God says in the rest of the book. Now, be careful here. Keep this in context. God is talking to a people that he's bringing into a land where he will be king. Israel was founded as a theocracy. God was king, and these rescued people were supposed to be its citizens, Israel's citizens. And those, so there's specific promises here that are connected to that people group in that land at that time. There's some general principles that apply to all of us. I'll do my best to sort of point those things out along the way. But we should be mindful not to read ourselves into the, the, the nation that this text makes promises to. Let's begin in chapter 26, verses 3 through 13. We see a promise of blessing for obedience. Okay, that's... Keep that in context. I want to I be really careful with this. There's a promise of blessing for obedience to the message of Leviticus for that people group in that land. And I guess I should say that these are promises plural because God promises to bless them in a few specific ways and I couldn't resist the urge to make a chart. In chapter 26 verses 3 through 5, there's this promise of rain and abundance in the land. It says this, if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and perform them, then I will give you rain in its season. The land shall yield its produce and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing shall last till the time of vintage and the vintage shall last till the time of sowing. 
You shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land safely. This phrase, dwell in your land safely, transitions into the next promise. If they would obey, God would give them rain and abundance in the land, but he would also give them peace in the land and victory in battle. Leviticus 26, 6 through 9. I will give you peace in the land and you shall lie down and none will make you afraid. I will rid the land of evil beasts and the sword will not go through your land. You will chase your enemies and they shall fall by the sword before you. Five of you shall chase a hundred and a hundred of you shall put 10,000 to flight. Your enemies shall fall by the sword before you for I will look on you favorably and make you fruitful, multiply you, and confirm my covenant with you. This is more than just passive peace. It's conquering victory that God promises them. God promises them that if they would obey, he would rout their enemies in miraculous ways as they took possession of the land he was giving them. Finally, if they would obey the things commanded in Leviticus, God promised to be with them. He would be in their midst and call them his own. Chapter 26, verses 10 through 13. You shall eat the old harvest and clear out the old because of the new. I will set my tabernacle among you and my soul shall not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God. And you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt that you should not be their slaves. I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you walk upright. Now, if you've read much of the Old Testament, you know that God did all of these things. Did he rout their enemies and fight for them and like... Oh, one guy just destroys a whole 200 soldiers. Over and over he does that. Does he give them rain and abundant harvest in its season? Yes. It really is a land flowing with milk and honey. He does prosper them. He does bless them in the land. And he is their God. He's in their midst. He did everything he said he would do here. Still, it's important to point out that these promises are specifically tied to a people in a specific land. Anyone standing in a pulpit today telling you if, they, if you just do things God's way, then you're guaranteed some financial blessing of abundance or victory over your human adversaries. And if anyone promising you health and wealth and prosperity in exchange for obedience in this life is misleading you. In general terms, life does go better when we honor the Lord, but these promises are about Israel. For believers in Christ, in the world today, our promises read a little differently. 2 Timothy 3.12, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. We aren't promised peace or abundance for godly living. We're promised persecution. And this wasn't an, a new idea that originated with the Apostle Paul. Matthew 16, 24, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Still, with the expectation of trouble for following Christ, we know that the Lord promises to never leave us or forsake us, right? That the trouble we experience in this life only refines our character and makes us long for home. It sharpens our focus on the kingdom that actually matters. But as far as these promises of blessing in Leviticus are concerned, 
They're set in and limited to the context of Leviticus. These are promises of blessing upon the nation of ancient Israel in the land God promised them. And that's good news because the next set of promises also exists in that exact same context and they aren't nearly as, present, as pleasant. He says that there's this promise of blessing for obedience, but then there's a warning of discipline for disobedience. Again, there's an if-then structure to this, verses 14 through 17, but if you do not obey me, and do not observe all these commandments, in other words, all the things we've studied in Leviticus, if you don't do them, and if you despise my statutes, or if your soul abhors my judgments, so that you do not perform all my commandments, but break my covenant, I also will do this to you. I will even appoint terror over you, wasting disease and fever which shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of the heart. And you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. I will set my face against you, and you shall be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you shall reign over you, and you shall flee when no one pursues you. Notice a few things. If they would obey, they would enjoy rain and abundant harvest and peace. They would have peace in the land and victory over their enemies. God would be with them and bless them. But if they were rebellious, they would forfeit those blessings. And what they would be left with is the precise opposite of those things. No rain, no harvest, no abundance, and the little bit that they're able to scratch out of the earth would be eaten by the enemies that would come and rule over them and terrorize them. So the question that comes up here is often this, was God's love for Israel conditional? If they did well, he blessed them. If they disobeyed, he disciplined them. Is his love for them conditional? And the answer is no, not at all. By show of hands, how many of you are parents? Lots of parents here. Now, by show of hands, how many of you have or had parents? Good. This metaphor works for everybody. All right. Is it good to reward your kids for bad behavior? Kids even know this. Some of you are nodding yes and you're wrong. We need to discipline you more. Is it true? Parents are the only ones that get to answer this question. Parents, is it true that often the most loving thing you can do for your kids is to discipline them when they misbehave so that they learn to live in a way that honors God? That is the most loving thing that we can do for our kids. And so God telling them in advance not only of the blessings that, are, that they receive if they obey, but of the consequences of their disobedience is not God having conditional love for Israel. It's God relating to them like a loving and responsible father who wants the best for his children. Notice verses 18 through 20. This isn't God just punishing them because he can. It's loving and corrective discipline meant to change their behavior. And after all this, if you do not obey, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. I will break the pride of your power. I will make your heavens like iron and your earth like bronze. And your strength shall be spent in vain. For your land shall not yield its produce nor shall the trees of the land yield their fruit. This phrase, after all this, if you still don't obey, that's key. The discipline gets progressively worse if they persist in defiance and rebellion. And that pattern gets repeated seven times in chapter 26. With each repetition, the severity of the consequences gets worse. And he says, and if you still don't obey... And if you still don't obey, and ultimately he says, and if you still don't obey, you will forfeit the land I'm giving you. 
and you will be dispersed and you'll live as slaves in foreign lands just like you were when I found you in Egypt. Ultimately, continued rebellion would lead to them forfeiting the land itself, languishing again in slavery. God warns them like a loving father. He warns them in advance. But chapter 26 does end with hope. For ancient Israel, as a nation, there was a promise of blessing for obedience. There was a promise of discipline for disobedience. And there was a promise of restoration for repentance. None of the loving and corrective discipline that would follow their rebellion and sin would be final. Even when scattered among the nations, if they would repent, they would be restored. Verses 40 through 42. This is chapter 26 still. But if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me and that they have also walked contrary to me and that I also have walked contrary to them and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they accept their guilt, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, my covenant with Isaac, and my covenant with Abraham. I will remember. I will remember the land. I don't know about you, but when I read the Bible and I read about all the ways that God blessed Israel and cared for Israel and fought for Israel and fed Israel with manna in the wilderness and performed miracles in their presence, I'm astounded at their unbelief. Is that just me? Like you, you read these, these things, these people got to experience of God and you go, and you still go and worship a little carved statue that you made? I mean, what? To me, it would be completely understandable if God were just to go, okay, you know what, Israel? I'm done. I'm done with you. I've put up with nonsense, this nonsense for way too long. I'm done. You're on your own. Good luck with the Canaanites. Figure it out. Have you ever felt that way? Just good thing I'm not God, right? We could understand if that was God's attitude because that would probably be our attitude. But God doesn't say that. He's patient with them. Patient beyond patient beyond patient. And here he says, no matter what they do, he will remember his promises to them. And the beauty of this passage is that it shows us that the point of Israel was never merely Israel. This nation was never merely about God establishing a nation in that geographic region of the world. There's a much bigger purpose for Israel. The covenant God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was a nation in a land to establish the heritage of the Messiah and to bring the blessings of God and the forgiveness of sin to all people groups through Jesus Christ. And when you read this and you go, God, why don't you just wipe these people off the map? They're terrible. Pause for a second and understand that if he's not patient with them, he has no basis to be patient with you and me. And that he, had he not been patient with them and, and sustained them even through their rebellion and disobedience, had he not worked even in the midst of their unfaithfulness, you and I would be without a savior. And we would still be enslaved to our rebellion and sin. He's patient with them and he promises to restore them because his love and purposes for them are bigger than them. And that's the point the apostle Paul makes with a rhetorical question in Romans chapter nine. This is verses 22 through 24. What if 
God, wanting to show his wrath and make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So read the history of Israel. It's a cycle of the things God's promised in chapter 26. They obey for a season, they enjoy the blessing. They rebel, he disciplines them. They repent, he restores them. It happens again, it happens again, it happens again. And all the while, God is long-suffering with this nation of people. Why? The answer to that question is in that passage in Romans 9. Why? To make known the riches of his glory, to bring the blessing of salvation in Jesus the Messiah to Jews and Gentiles, to you and to me. Even though Israel would turn and rebel and persist in unbelief, God would patiently and lovingly work in and through them, even in their unbelief, to bring salvation to the world. You see, it was Israel's rebellion and unbelief that put Christ on the cross, wasn't it? Was it not the children of Israel that shouted, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him? It's through him that we experience the blessing of God, the forgiveness of sin, and full status as citizens of his kingdom. In this life, we will suffer many things. But in him, all we'll know is abundance and blessing and peace. As a side note, God still isn't done with Israel. His redemptive work began with them. Right now, God is primarily at work through the church, but one day, and perhaps one day very soon, I believe the Lord will bring us home, and upon the rapture of the church, it'll once again be the nation of Israel as the primary means through which God makes himself known in the world. Rest assured, no matter what you see on the news in the coming days, weeks, and months, every promise God made to Israel will be fulfilled. Every single one. So that's chapter 26, Appendix A, if you will, the results of obeying or disobeying God's law. Chapter 27 stands alone. It's a completely separate thing. It reads like an Appendix B. In it are regulations regarding giving to God. So remember, ancient Israel was founded as a theocracy. God was king, and the administration of his government was intertwined with religious observance. The priests were fed and provided for through the means established by law, and so was the tabernacle, the house of worship for the whole nation. And that context is key to understanding this concept of a tithe, which is mentioned at the end of chapter 27. Now, I'm going to only read one of them. There are three verses in Leviticus about tithing. Three. 27 chapters, three verses about tithing. Here's one of them that gives you the gist of what he's getting at. And all the tithe of the, of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. So 10% of the increase of the land, whether crops or animals, were given to the Lord for the administration of his government and for the care of the tabernacle. And if that sounds like a lot, understand that you and I would probably love for the combined rate of all the ways in which we're taxed to be fixed at 10%. Anybody sign up for that? Would anybody vote for that? 10%, that's the limit. That's all you get taxed, 10% of your increase. It's April, tax season, 10% doesn't sound too bad. 
Still, before we get too far into this, let me just say that there are no commands to tithe in this same way under the new covenant. Okay? There are none. There's plenty of people that will try to make the case that you aren't being faithful or you aren't being obedient if you aren't giving a certain amount to the church. Let me put you at ease right now. I will in no way try to twist you up with guilt so that you give to the church. You will never hear that from this pulpit as long as I'm the pastor here. The rule we function by is 2 Corinthians 9, 7. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. That's the rule. You give what God lays on your heart to give, and that's it. It's between you and him. In Leviticus 27, we see a very small note about tithing. Three verses, which was not optional under that form of government. It was their tax basis. It's how they funded God's administration of this theocracy called Israel. We've already read about the mandatory tithing that Leviticus offers. Three verses. The bulk of chapter 27 is about giving as an expression of worship, which is always voluntary. Now, there were and are many ways to give to the Lord as an act of worship. Chapter 27 outlines some of those ways for the children of Israel and provides them some guidance. Remember, the plan at this point, when they're receiving this from Moses, the plan, as far as they know, is for Moses to lead that generation, the same generation that left Egypt, they are supposed to be going into the land, inheriting the land. This is before they refuse to trust God and conquer Canaan. At this point, as far as they know, in about one year's time, a man could go from making bricks, slaving under the Egyptian sun, just barely eking out a living, to enjoying an abundant harvest in land he owns. That, that change could happen in one year's time, as far as they know. So now imagine that a man is enjoying that harvest and reflecting upon all the things God's done. He's been delivered from slavery in a land of sin and death. He's been blessed with this abundant land inheritance. And suppose he's a man of faith, and he's just so thankful to God that he and his family were free. He, he wants to thank God that his children will never know the slavery he's experienced. Out of gratitude. Suppose he wants to devote himself or his family to God as an expression of worship. How can he do that? Well, he can't serve in the tabernacle. Why not? He's not a Levite. Yet he wants to commit his life to seeing God praised, but he can't physically work in the tabernacle because there's this, this message and this lesson that the priesthood is supposed to teach. Chapter 27 tells him how. It leaves the ministry and the message of the priesthood intact while providing an avenue for those who weren't Levites to partner in the priestly work. Does that make sense? I mean, just as a general term, that's what 27, chapter 27 does. It leaves the ministry and the message of the priesthood intact while providing an avenue for those who weren't Levites to partner in the priestly work. Chapter 27, 1 through 3. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When a man consecrates by a vow certain persons to the Lord according to your valuation, if your valuation is of a male from 20 years old up to 60 years old, then your valuation shall be 50 shekels of silver according to the shekel of the sanctuary. This section goes on to say that for 10 shekels, an old woman would be considered dedicated, and for 5 shekels, a young boy would be considered dedicated. And before you look at me cross-eyed like what in the world is going on there, remember, only Levites could serve in the tabernacle. So this is an exchange rate. 
If someone couldn't do the work because they weren't a Levite, they could still partner in that work financially. And so these different amounts have nothing to do with the value of the individual people. This money is given in place of physical service in the tank, in the, in the sanctuary, in the tabernacle. So let's just think about this for a second. How much more work would a fighting age man do than a four-year-old boy? Quite a lot more, right? A fighting age guy, 30 years old, fit as a fiddle, going to get a lot more physical labor done if he were allowed to serve in the tabernacle than a four-year-old boy. And so for him to say, I'm devoting my life to serving in this way. I can't do the physical work, so here's my 50 shekels. Now my life is considered dedicated to the Lord. Five shekels for the little boy. Make sense? That's what the dedication rate, that's why the dedication rate is different. But the wonderful truth here is this. The boy who could do five shekels of work was considered every bit as devoted to God as the man who could do 50. The old woman who was capable of 10 shekels was considered just as devoted to God as anyone else. They keep developing this idea. Verse 8, But if he's too poor to pay your valuation... Then he shall present himself before the priests, and the priest shall set a value for him according to the, the ability of him who vowed. The priest shall value him. So the man who desired to partner in the priestly work, he's just wanting to express gratitude and worship for God, but he couldn't even fit five shekels into his budget. There's provision for that. He was still considered every bit as dedicated to the Lord as if he could pay the full amount. Because his giving came from his heart. It came from a worshipful heart. Now, you and I aren't barred from service. There's no requirement that anyone be a Levite to serve in the church. Still, there are people who God calls to this work on a full-time basis. There's people who've invested their lives to prepare for as aspects of ministry that just take a lot of work and therefore take a lot of time. And there's other people that have other vocations and other skills and other ways to contribute to the work that God's doing. And so whether it's time or resources or a combination of both, whatever you give in service to the Lord, God accepts and is honored by whatever you offer, so long as it comes from your heart. What this section leaves us with is a principle that should inform our thinking when it comes to giving as an act of worship, and here it is. While our giving should be proportional to what God has entrusted to us, right? The, the portion for a grown man who's capable of the grown man's work was different than the portion that was designated for a little boy. While our giving should be portional, proportional to what God has entrusted to us, God is more concerned with the heart of the worshiper than the size of the gift. Remember the contrast with the widow and the wealthy in Luke 24. Remember there's these rich men who give a fair amount, but not proportional to their resources. And then there's this poor widow who gives her last two pennies. And what does Jesus say? Truly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all. For all these out of their abundance have put in offerings to God. But she out of her poverty has put in all the livelihood that she had. There's the principle. While our giving should be proportional to what God has entrusted to us, God is much more concerned with the heart of the worshiper than the size of the gift. So beyond wanting to partner in the priestly work and giving a portion of money in place of actual labor in the tabernacle, a person could dedicate a portion of his field or a house or an animal to the Lord. Remember, this is a brand new country, brand new nation. The, the economy and its currency were still developing. And so it was just as common to exchange items 
that had monetary value as it was to exchange currency itself. And so again, we see giving to God as a voluntary act of worship. Those items could be dedicated to the priestly service rather than currency. If you decided you wanted to give something that was worth 50 shekels instead of 50 shekels, you could. Or if you decided you want to give a certain animal or a portion of your field, whatever it was, vowing to make that offering was not to be taken lightly. Okay, And that drives us to this next principle that should inform our thinking about giving. Giving should never be taken lightly. Leviticus 27, 14 through 15. And when a man dedicates his house to be holy to the Lord, then the priest shall, shall set a value for it. Whether it is good or bad, as the priest values it, so it shall stand. If he who dedicated it wants to redeem his house, then he must add one-fifth of the money of your valuation to it, and it shall be his. So if a man dedicated a piece of real estate in place of actual currency. Perhaps it was going to be rented out and then that money was going to be used for ministry in the tabernacle or whatever the case may be. If he, if he dedicated it for that purpose and then later on decided, you know, I really think I, I want that house back. I need to use it for a different thing. It wasn't just as simple as, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll buy it back now. He had to buy it back at a 20% increase over the valuation that the priests determined the real estate was worth. And the same was true for a portion of a field or an animal, lots of different things that were associated with what they give in terms of currency, items in exchange for currency. Remember, though, no one had to do this. These gifts were voluntary. We read that clearly in, the, in Deuteronomy 23, 22 through 23. Uh, 22 through 23. Okay, there, there's no, no problem, no offense, no sin if you just don't make such vows. No, to, to commit something to the Lord and not fulfill that commitment, that was a problem. But if you just didn't make the commitment in the first place, there's no problem. There's no sin involved. It says, when you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and it would be sin to you. But if you abstain from vowing, it shall not be sin to you. That which has gone from your lips you shall keep and perform, for you voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised with your mouth. There's certainly some overlap in our culture. Remember, the priesthood today is all believers in Jesus Christ. We aren't barred from serving the Lord in the, in the temple because we are the temple. But when we commit to serving, when we commit to being there, when we commit to giving our time or our resources to the work of the Lord through the church or whatever else it is, and we renege on that commitment because something else comes up, that's not irredeemable sin, but it is it is something that God takes seriously, and so should we. We should carefully consider how God has blessed and provided for us. We shouldn't take giving lightly. We should carefully consider how God has blessed and provided for us and give accordingly. The Apostle Paul offers this advice to the church at Corinth. Now, it seems that they've made some pledge to support his ministry endeavors, his missionary journey. They expressed the desire to give, but then struggled with follow-through. He very gently says in 2 Corinthians 8, 10 through 12, And in this I give advice. It is to your advantage not only to be doing what you began and were desiring to do a year ago, but now you also must complete the doing of it. That as there was a readiness to desire it, so there also may be a completion out of what you have. For if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has, and not according to what one does not have. 
So Paul here says, we can't give out of what we don't have. But we should be giving out of what we do have. And so carefully consider how God has blessed you. If it's time, if it's a skill, if it's a listening ear or the ability to labor in prayer, all those things are needful and beneficial in the life of the church. And there's certain things that just cost money. Electricity and ink and steel and concrete all cost money. But here's the deal. Everything that this church needs, whether it has a monetary price tag or not, is right here. Everything that this church needs is right here. I'm so thankful to be part of a church that shows up for each other like you guys do. And prays for each other like you do. And will serve and work and help like you do. Stony Ford Community Church, you are precious in that. So our giving should be proportionate. It should be from the heart. It should be something we carefully consider rather than taking lightly. Third, giving should never become a form of spiritual manipulation. Giving should never become a form of spiritual manipulation. Never. In verse 27, or in chapter 27 rather, we see that God gives instructions for how non-Levites could partner in the priestly work. He gives instructions for not being careless, not just giving as an afterthought, but being intentional and actually following through. And God in his infinite wisdom anticipates that some people will try to use giving to the tabernacle as a means by which they can appear before others as more spiritual than they really are. Leviticus 27, 26. But the firstborn of the animals, which should be the Lord's firstborn, no man shall dedicate, whether it is an ox or a sheep. It is the Lord's. Okay, remember, an animal could be given as though it were currency. It could be given as part of that worship offering in dedicating oneself to the Lord's work because you would be barred from doing that if you weren't a Levite. But the firstborn animal was already supposed to be offered as part of the sacrificial system. It was an image of God giving his only begotten son in place of sinful man. But what some people would be tempted to do was score social brownie points by calling that required sacrifice a free will offering. Oh, I, I got an idea. I want everybody to think I'm really special and how, look how devoted to the Lord I am, everybody. I'm going to give this thing that I'm already required to give, but I'm going to say it was optional. And then everybody will be impressed and they will go, oh, what a good Christian you are. That's what's going on here. That's what God is anticipating and prohibiting in advance. And today our culture is ripe with people trying to appear more spiritual than they are, making a show out of things that they should be doing for the Lord anyway. Listen, God is never fooled by the ways in which people try to show off their devotion. You can fool a lot of people, but you can't fool God. Matthew 6, 1 through 4, take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in their synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. So there's another side of this giving to be seen. And it's coming up with spiritual sounding reasons to keep 
more than God would permit. Okay? There's two ways God anticipates this manipulation regarding giving. One we've looked at, it's giving to be noticed. Doing something I should be doing for the Lord so that other people can see me. The other way is keeping more than God would permit. There were many times throughout the history of Israel that God would devote a certain people or nation or, or, or I mean, a whole, whole cities at times, he would devote them to destruction. Okay? God is telling Israel to go and conquer these lands, and there's lots of reasons why he would want these people groups to be conquered, but just think of it as God has put something under a judicial penalty, whether it's people or city or land or livestock, whatever it is, he's put something under a judicial penalty. And he's told the people of Israel, go and destroy all of it. Don't keep a nickel for yourself. All of it needs to burn. Well, if it's just going to get thrown away anyway, might as well pocket some. Let me come up with a spiritual sounding reason to keep more than God has told me to keep. And that's exactly what's going on in verses 28 through 29. Nevertheless, no devoted thing, no devoted offering, that's devoted to destruction, no devoted offering that a man may devote to the Lord of all that he has, both man and beast, or the field of his possessions shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted offering is most holy to the Lord. No person under the ban who may become doomed to destruction among men shall be redeemed, but shall surely be put to death. Listen, there are those who will parade around in the name of Jesus that will pocket things God has never intended for them to keep. And they'll manipulate people and guilt people into giving to enrich their own lives rather than seeing those gifts used for the purposes God has intended. Rest assured, God sees and will deal with them accordingly. For us, let it be enough to worship God from sincere hearts and trust in him with all of our needs. You see, God's allowing us to join him in his priestly work, sharing the good news of Jesus with the world. And some will go, and some will send those who go. Some will support the work in encouragement and prayer, and some will support the work in the physical resources that are needed. All of those someones are needed and acceptable and valuable as expressions of worship for who God is and what he's done in sending Christ to reconcile sinful rebels like us to a holy God. So whether you're a goer or a sender, that's acceptable worship for who God is. Whether the way you support that work is by coming and doing that physical work or by giving resources in order to see that it's done, it's good and acceptable and pleasing to the Lord so long as it comes from your heart. So we'll wrap up Leviticus with two points of application. One, revere God with all that you are. So much of what we read in the sacrificial system and ceremonial law is just expressions of reverence. God is holy. The space around him should be kept holy. And through the work of Jesus, we're reconciled. We, we get to represent God in the world. And that should, that should move us to want to represent him well. To have a reverence for who he is. For Israel, he promised blessing if they did well and discipline if they didn't. And while that blessing and discipline isn't as neatly defined for us, it's still true that God disciplines his children. And there certainly are good things that come with our obedience. In that, though, there's a better motivation for our holy living, for, for our desire to honor the Lord. 
the better motion, motivation is this. We, we should be seeking God's face and not his hand. Our, our hope should be that we're reconciled to God and he looks upon us and says, well done, good and faithful servant, rather than doing something that we're trying to get God to bless and enrich our temporary lives. We should seek his face, not his hand. Revere God with all that you are. Second, worship God with all that you have. Is it true that all good things come from God and who there is no variableness or shadow of turning? Is that true? You don't sound sure. Is it true that all good things come from God? Yes. Is it true that he's called us and redeemed us and prepared us to do good works in advance. Not for salvation, but because we have salvation. Is that, is that true? It's true. So the simple truth is this. We can never outgive God. He gave his son as the perfect lamb to atone for the sins of the world. Leviticus is full of that imagery. We can never outgive God. In Christ, we're made new and we're given eternal life. There's nothing more valuable than that. Nothing ever could be. So our attitude toward stuff and our attitude toward money and our attitude toward opportunity to serve the Lord ought to be this. God, all I have is from you and for you. Use me to glorify your name and to make you known in all the world. I would encourage you in light of reading Leviticus, trusting in Christ as your Savior and King, to make that your prayer. God, all I have is from you and for you. Use me to glorify your name and make you known in all the world. Let's pray together. Mm -hmm.